Let's start awake. We'll get there. Beautiful. We have a new series this month and probably through on next three or four weeks. It's going to be exciting. I'm really excited about this idea of kingdom now. I hope you are too. It's going to be really neat. It's going to challenge some of your thinking and we're going to grow. Yes? Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, a while back, there was this ridiculously stupid video on YouTube. And it was trending for, a, there's many of them, it was trending for a long time. And I remember when I was teaching English and Bible in this school, I had some of my kids come up to me and they were like, have you seen this video? It's like, what video? Tell me what video. I was expecting like more cat videos or something. And so they said, no, it's, it's, it's Charlie the Unicorn. It's like, Charlie the Unicorn, what is this? And so I watch it. And as I'm watching it, I literally, I can feel my brain cells dying. <laughs> I'm watching it. It's just the stupidest thing I think I've ever seen. And so I'm watching it, and I'm trying to make sense of it. I'm like, what, what is the point? I don't get this. Millions of hits on this stupid video. What happens is this. Charlie, this unicorn, he's minding his own business, doing his own thing. And his friends come to him, and they say, Charlie, you have to go to Candy Mountain. Some of you, this, the way it's even said is haunting. Charlie. And Charlie's like, I'm doing fine. I'm just laying here minding my own business. Leave me alone. No, Charlie, you have to go to Candy Mountain. And so Charlie finally agrees after being, he's been sung to and his friends jump on top of him. Finally, he says, okay, I'll go to Candy Mountain. I'll go to this Candy Mountain, this place of goodness and great and blah, 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 blah. I'll go. So he ends up going, and as they're walking, his friends start teasing him because he begins asking questions about Candy Mountain. How is this even real? This sounds weird. I don't know. Do I buy this? And they begin to mock him. They begin to say, shun the non-believer. And in the end, poor Charlie, he ends up very hurt, broken, and alone, totally loses trust in his friends, friends. And he realizes Candy Mountain is nothing like they said it would be. Years later, I begin seeing this in faith communities that I attend. Candy Mountain, this story that I thought was so stupid, I begun to see our churches do the same thing. Sometimes in faith communities, we'll soar in on people and we'll dangle this carrot, heaven, if you do this, if you drink our Kool-Aid, you'll have heaven someday. And we dangle it. And for some people, there's a lot of hope. And they think, yes, heaven, that sounds great. These people seem nice. And many times, they'll come to our faith communities. And then some of them will be again asking questions. And in some faith communities, that is not looked on as a good thing. And then they'll begin to experience something that is just terrible because what happens then is they begin to see that the God that these people have been talking about and these people look nothing alike. And this heaven that they're speaking about, they begin to look and they say, well, they're not even living that now. And stuff begins to come up. And before you know it, some people, when they come to church, they begin to feel lonely and angry and frustrated. And they're left just like Charlie, alone and bitter. I believe he has no liver at the end, correct? Weird. No kidney. Thank you. Let me pray with you. God, I want to thank you and praise you that you've brought us here this morning to learn more about what your kingdom looks like. Lord, let us be the kind of faith community that doesn't just talk about heaven, but we literally live it. Let us be the community that doesn't just teach about a far off distant candy mountain, but we teach about a very present heavenly kingdom now and one that reaches into eternity. We thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. I think most of us, when we look at the world, we would agree things are not how they should be. Would you agree with that? If you, if you don't, you probably haven't been watching the news, right? When's the last time you watched the news and something really powerfully happy came on? It just doesn't happen. Most of the time, it's really negative stuff. And you, you leave the news thinking, oh, what's on NBC? Oh, same thing. Fox? Oh, boy. 
you begin to look at this, the world is not how it should be. We get this sense. In the Garden of Eden, we're told again in Genesis that it starts with this beauty. Everything is supposed to be moving toward what it looks like to create, and we begin to move toward freedom, justice, peace. That's what it's supposed to look like, harmony, caring for each other and the, and the animals and everything else around us. But we're told also that man decides to go a different direction. He's deceived. He believes that maybe there's a life apart from God. And he goes the wrong direction. And what happens is things go horribly wrong. Genesis 4. These two individuals come onto the scene. Cain and Abel. How many of you know this story from the felt board? You remember it, Cain and Abel. They offer up these sacrifices, Cain and Abel. We begin to see the first murder. And what happens here is interesting to me because in chapter 4, it says Cain cultivated the ground. Abel was a shepherd. I never thought about this until not that long ago. Cain is a farmer. He has strong senses of boundaries. Cain is very concerned with his land. This land is my land. It's not your land. I'll build fences. Don't cross them. I have a big dog. He'll bite your leg off. This land is my land. Right? Freestyling. This land is my land. Stay off it. Strong sense of boundaries. And then there's Abel, who's a shepherd. He's nomadic. He goes wherever his flock takes him. The land is to be used, and it's to be appreciated, enjoyed. It is the Lord's land. And we begin to see that Cain and Abel, at some point, there's going to be a conflict. It's not going to be too long until the two paths meet and conflict. And so we have our first murder. Genesis 4.16 says this, so Cain left the Lord's presence. In verse 15, it actually says, God put a mark on Cain. And it said, no one will touch Cain. It was this mercy action that God did for him. Even the first murderer, God chooses to show mercy. Shouldn't we show mercy toward each other? God shows mercy to the first murderer, and we have a, a difficult time showing mercy to people in our own faith community. He shows mercy. But it says this about Cain. Cain leaves the Lord's presence and settles in the land of Nod, east of Eden. He makes his home east of Eden. When Danielle and I were moving to, to California, we were moving toward heaven. Yeah, it's beautiful. West is where heaven is in Orange County. Cain moves east of Eden. He leaves Eden. He leaves paradise. He stops living heaven. He moves away from Eden. And he settles down there and begins to take root. And what happens in chapter 6, it says, the world has gone wrong. The people of the earth began to multiply on the earth. They began to spread out. It says, son, they multiplied and daughters were born of them. The sons saw the beautiful women, took any of them they wanted as their own. They began claiming things, putting claims on everything around them. East of Eden, we are more concerned with ownership than each other. East of Eden, we begin to see violence, injustice, War, east of Eden. East of Eden is where we begin to see Cain and evil begin to form. East of Eden. This world was corrupt and violent, it says. And the Lord says, I want, I'm going to send a flood. We need to stop this thing, this movement. And so God says, this is my kingdom. This is what you're creating. I want you guys to look at some interesting things about the difference between God's kingdom 
and man's empire. Here we go. I've just got a couple little bar graphs for you. How many of you like bar graphs? You're bar graph people. You freaks. All right, good. So God's kingdom. It was originally intended to be the priesthood, Peter says, the priesthood of all believers. We are supposed to participate with God and do these active things in creating life, bringing peace and justice. That's what we were supposed to do. But what we end up doing is we remove God from the equation. I've seen this so many times. Jesus is a cute figure on the felt board, isn't he? Nice little red sash. Jumps in whenever there's a mystery to be solved. Right? But, but, but when it comes to like real world issues, like social justice, economics, we say this to Jesus. Um... Why don't you keep worrying about those felt board things? We'll take care of those things. We got this. If we really took Jesus' words seriously, I think our world would look a little differently. Wouldn't it? God's empire, we're supposed to help the poor, the sick, and the homeless. In man's empire, we take advantage and exploit the sick the poor and the homeless. God's kingdom, we welcome the immigrant. Man's empire, we create rigid borders. God's kingdom was supposed to be a place of peace, harmony with each other. The empire of man, military might, helps keep our extravagance, our freedom. Kingdom of God was supposed to be just, the empire of man always looks unjust. Kingdom of God treats prisoners well. Empire of man exploits and oppresses them. Kingdom of God has God as their ruler. God reigns. Our God reigns. That used to be an exciting thing to talk about back then. Our God reigns. Today we're like, I'm not sure we want him to reign. Because my life might change. In the empire of man, it is man who reigns. And man left to his own selfishness creates an empire of greed, violence, hate, injustice. It doesn't take long before we th see things fall apart. Turn with me to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. In Isaiah 14, God says, I am reclaiming my people. And we are going to look at Babylon and we're going to say, well, that was dumb. We're going to look at Babylon and say, we don't have to live like that anymore. We're free. Isaiah 14, God's people look back at Babylon and they say, that's no way to live. And so in Isaiah 14, we begin to see some interesting things come up. He begins to point out to Babylon, with one voice they cry out, Now you are as weak as we are. Your might and power were buried with you. The sound of the harp in your palace has ceased. Now maggots are your sheet, worms are your blanket. How long do empires of man last that are built on injustice, war, hate? How long do these empires last? Not that long. Yeah, Solomon says it's just a passing, fleeting moment. The kingdom of God goes on through eternity. Which kingdom are you going to choose to belong to? That's the question. In Isaiah 14, he says this, Empires are aggressively seeking to rule other people. They're aggressive. They're arrogant with their resources. I remember hearing in history lessons when the Indians, when they would look at what the settlers were doing, they would just fall down weeping when they would see how people exploited the earth. Empires exploit. They take advantage of. Some of these Native Americans, they were so sad when they saw what was going on because they understood what the kingdom should look like. Empires believe in their exceptionalism, but they are always knocked down, aren't they? Pride goes before a fall, and these empires always fall. 
One is very beastly looking. Revelation says the other is lamb-like. Some of you are thinking, are we really going there? These are strong words, aren't they? Is this a very exciting message to you so far? I just want to get a cue. I want to see how we're doing. Some of you are thinking, we live in America. Ouch. But there's still hope, isn't there? No one believes there's hope. We are in trouble. I hope there's hope. I hope there's hope. There's a story in Genesis 11 about the Tower of Babel. And when I was younger, when I read this story of the Tower of Babel, I remember my parents, again, they were very dramatic on the felt board. And they would be talking about this tower and how these people built this big tower. And I understood this tower to mean a couple things back then. That these people, God was mad at these people because they were trying to reach heaven. And what if these people reached heaven? They'd be able to just walk right in. God doesn't want that. Isn't that weird what we begin to think when we're little? I was terrified. I was like, maybe I could stack, I need to be careful when I'm stacking my cushions from the couch. I may not be able to understand mom and dad later. I used to think these weird things about the Tower of Babel, and we have some interesting ideas about the Tower of Babel. They thought they could reach heaven. And here's the deal. Heaven, it is true, they thought they could reach heaven, but not literally. This idea of heaven, we as Adventists, we talk about heaven as this place that we'll someday get to. But the Hebrews, if you haven't heard anything yet, listen to this now. The Hebrews, when they talked about heaven and they talked about hell, these were not some day places that you might go to. If you die, you go to heaven or you go to hell. For the Hebrews, these were things you presently experience. My week, when I say my week was hell, I'm not telling you that I literally went down into a fiery furnace with some dude with red pajamas. I'm saying my week was hard. It looked like death. It was killer. It was hard. When I say my week looked awesome, beautiful, like heaven, I'm saying I literally experienced God all throughout the week. Kingdom of heaven. The word heavens literally meant the atmosphere around us where God reigns. Anyone have an aha moment yet? When Jesus comes onto the picture at his resurrection, he says, heaven begins now and someday I'm going to come back and you're going to see its fullness. We're Seventh-day Adventists, but guess what? Many of us have forgotten something very simple. Adventists just, it doesn't mean just the end when Jesus comes again. We are supposed to be advancing heaven now. To be an Adventist, we are advancing the kingdom of heaven now. How are you advancing the kingdom of heaven now? Are you advancing the kingdom of heaven or advancing your own empire? What are you doing with this idea of heaven and hell? Jesus says in Matthew 19, he has this rich young ruler that comes to him. And the rich young ruler asks a question that many of us are asking. Matthew 18. Sorry, Matthew 19. Someone came to Jesus with this question. Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And the translation means literally to come into life. This was not him asking, how do I get to some faraway place? It was how do I come into life now? Because you'll get this. Jesus' advice is not, oh, well, start doing this and this and this so that you can someday get there. Watch what he says to the man. Why ask me what's good, Jesus replied. There's only one who is good. But to answer your question, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. And again, we understand these commandments. One through four, relational. Five through ten. How we relate to one another. One through four, how we relate to God, 
5 through 10, how we relate to one another. And look what Jesus focuses on. He doesn't start talking about the relational element with him. He talks about how we treat each other, which is what kingdom of God looks like. So he says, the man says, which one? I want to start doing it so I can experience your kingdom. And Jesus says, you must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal, testify falsely, honor your mother and your father, love your neighbor as yourself. He's missing one, isn't he? Which one is he missing? Don't covet your neighbor's belongings. Jesus left one out purposely. Some of us struggle with this. We want to build our empire. We want so much stuff in our garage. We want this, 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 and this, and we will we'll do terrible things to the people around us. Take advantage of them so that we may have a bigger empire. He leaves this one out. And the man says, of course, I've done them all. What else must I do? Jesus gets to the heart of it. If you want to be perfect, go sell all your possessions. Give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. You will have treasure in this life. Then come and follow me. If the man were to be putting his value in other things rather than money, his life would begin to drastically change, not later, but now. He would begin living that way now. He would begin experiencing what Jesus, he goes over and over with this word, this phrase, kingdom of heaven, over 119 times in the gospels alone does he bring up kingdom of God. He is very concerned with how we live now. And this word kingdom has come yet will be in the Greek Have you seen the kingdom of God now? What are you focusing on? When you talk about the world around you, what are you talking about? How terrible and evil and messed up it is? Or how you are beginning to experience and see God's presence now? Which is your focus? Your focus will begin to determine how you live now. I promise you that. How do you live now? What is your focus Jesus is not thrown off by this question. It's what people were talking about during this time. They were talking about the age to come, where there is redemption, where they see things restored, where there is peace, and they believe that when the Messiah came, there was going to be a kingdom. And that's what they referred to as the age to come. Here's what we do. When we think about kingdom, this is what we think. We think a future place somewhere very distant. And because we think of a future place somewhere really distant, that enables us to no longer live now. Is that messed up, anyone? If heaven is just some faraway place that someday I'll get to, then I don't have to treat my neighbor well now, do I? I'll just pass through the magical Skittle rainbow and I'll become perfect somehow. And then I'll begin treating people well. Loving my neighbors. That is a messed up, weird idea. For the Jews, heaven is now and someday. For us, we think about heaven and all we talk about are lions and lambs and sliding down giraffe's necks. And that's weird. It's weird that we start, all we talk about is ourself when we talk about heaven. For the Jews during this time with the Roman Empire, oppressing them, when they talked about heaven, they talked about it in this way. When the kingdom of God comes, we're going to overthrow Rome, and then we will be on top and we'll oppress the Romans. Is that heaven? Both sides had it wrong. And Jesus comes and shows us through his life, death, and resurrection, Father, forgive them. He is being murdered on a cross. And he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He shows us what heaven 
looks like, how to treat one another. When heaven or the kingdom of God is mentioned, it's always associated with the idea that it has come and there is a fullness yet to be. So back to the Tower of Babel. They thought they could reach heaven. And here's the issue. They thought what they were doing was going to bring them life. They thought that this empire way of life was bringing them life. They thought by oppressing people, using violence, extravagance, war, injustice, they thought that was bringing them heaven. And we find out it didn't. Genesis 1 through 4, sorry, 11 verse 4 says this. Then they said, come, let's build a great city for ourselves. Let us build a great, this was the empire of selfies. Why is it we're so focused on selfies, you guys? It's weird. If you really think about it, Instagram, all this stuff, we post so many selfies. Some of you probably posted one this morning. Going to church. Selfie. Sabbath selfie. We become this weird culture that is so focused on ourselves. Selfies become a weird term that we just accept because we're selfish. We not only pledge allegiance to the flag, we pledge allegiance to Maybelline, Ralph Lauren, Apple or Mac. We become this weird culture that is so focused on self. And here in America, we'd be created this empire. And I pray to the Lord that at some point, we as a people will get it. We'll start creating kingdom rather than empire. Look at this. Let us build this for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the heavens. This will make us famous. We are so focused on being famous. I was watching on Facebook. Because that's what we do, right? And you can buy, you can buy this interesting package where people will follow you for a day. You will have a bunch of people following you with cameras, pretending that you're famous. You can buy your own paparazzi. And people are doing it. We want to be famous so badly. It's stupid. I remember having a couple of people say, you look like Andy Roddick. And you know what? I felt good about myself. I was like, really? I think I do? I remember walking around thinking, I wonder if that guy thinks I'm Andy Roddick. I'm famous. Stupid. Look what else it says here. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. Empires are insecure. They're afraid of losing territory, which is why they're always trying to advance it. They need to expand. Empires, though, they're like these water balloons that my daughter fills up. And I watch and I giggle because I know it's going to happen. She doesn't know to pull the water balloon out. She just lets it keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it gets so big that I just think, it's going to pop any second. And you wait, and boom, water all over her and Kaysen. And I laugh because it's so funny to me. Empires do the same thing. We build, 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 get bigger, bigger, bigger. We're so focused on self, self, self. And before you know it, bam, it blows up and we scatter. We were not meant to live like that, were we? So the Tower of Babel falls because empires that are unjust, arrogant, oppressive, insecure, violent, hateful, they never last long. And what causes division? Focused on self. What causes churches to divide? Focus on self. Getting my way all the time. Self-focus, Luther says, sin is to be curved in on oneself. It literally causes death. And Jesus said, I came to show you a different way to live. May our churches be others focused and secure in God, the God of the universe. 
Jesus came to the world not to indoctrinate it, not to create another selfish, selfie empire, not to lead violent revolts, keep people safely comfortable in their pews. It's not what Jesus came to do. In Luke, Jesus tells us what he came to do. 4 verse 18, it's one of my favorite verses. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Whenever an empire would come in and take over states, they would send a messenger, an apostle. This messenger would go out and they would spread the good news. You've been conquered! Good things are about to happen because we have a great empire and our emperor is amazing. That's what these people would do. So God, Jesus says, I have called you to spread good news, euangelion, good news of my kingdom, of my reign, and you'll tell the poor. You will set the captives free. The blind will see. The oppressed will be set free. In the time of the Lord's favor, his kingdom has come. So a friend of mine said, Tony, your theology is awesome. It always challenges me, blah, blah, blah. But you never talk about application. I'm like, oh, application. Right. What does this have to do with me and how I live now? Good point. Here's the application. Hear it. The application is simple. Look at your own life. Look at your community around you. Are you building a life centered around God as king, reigning over your life? Is your church building bricks or is it building up lives? Is your life centered around living the kind of life Jesus speaks of, the kind that is lived now, or are you too busy building your own empire? Because God says you can participate in my kingdom now or you can begin building your own empire now. One will last, the other will have you walking away feeling very alone. Which will you choose? We have a chance coming up September 12 and 13. Some of us, we said, we want evangelism to be different. We want to try something that Jesus says to do. And so we found out human trafficking is happening here in Orange County. We said, we want to be part of the solution. People are asking questions. How do we keep our kids safe? How do we keep our community safe? They're asking these questions. They're not asking what the mark of the beast is. Do you know that? Most of your neighbors, that's not the first question they're asking. They're asking, how do we keep our kids safe? And so we are going to attempt to answer that question. We're going to bring in community members, law enforcement, action groups. And on, on Friday night, we're going to have a guest speaker come in and talk about justice. Why we should care about social justice. Then on Sabbath here in the sanctuary... We're going to speak about justice, biblical justice. And then at 2 o'clock, we are going to bring in community members from all over Orange County. We're going to have them on a panel. And they're going to ask questions. And we are going to ask questions. And then they're going to have booths set up that we can actually team up with our community and help stop human trafficking. Amen? We can begin living kingdom now where we actually do something. Rather than sitting here navel-gazing, we have a chance to go out and do something powerful. And we are begging you, all of you, to be there. Support this. How awkward would it be if, if the rest of the community showed up but you didn't? <laughs> We're just a building. They can find any civic center anywhere. We want it to be here because we want to let people know we care about this world that we live in. Will you join us? People are watching on video. I want you to be aware of that. Will you join us? Thank you. I'm so excited to continue this series with you. Kingdom Now. Let's stand and sing.